Reyes. He is the Director of Community Mobilization with the Latino Commission on AIDS, and he will be making a presentation regarding National Latino AIDS Awareness Day, uh, which is today, October 15th, on the last day of National Hispanic um, Heritage Month. Um, thank you, Luis, for being with us today. And whenever you are ready, feel free to get started. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to us, Latino Commissioner Nates, and to me um, as the director of um, ENLA, basically, uh, to present to you and the community about what we do and why we do ENLA every day. So I will share my screen. You said you can do that, right? Okay, um, again, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Luis Mares, I'm the Director of Community Mobilization um, in the Latino Commission on AIDS, and therefore I'm the one who coordinates uh, National Latinx AIDS Awareness Day every year. Um, to present to you uh, about NLAT, I will have to also to mention uh, the status of the HIV uh, epidemic in the Latin community and why we consider it a health disparity because this is the reason why we do NLAT every year. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce you um, uh, the Commission, for those who don't know about the Commission. The Latino Commission on AIDS was founded in 1990, and it was um, uh, uh, created with a, a, to, get, um, to address the impact of HIV was having at that point, uh, and still having in the Latino community. Um, we do not focus now only on HIV and AIDS. We have also uh, focused on different topics like viral hepatitis and every health disparity that affects the Latino community and the LGBT community, not only in New York, but in the country. We have programs uh, at a local uh, level in the city, regional, talking about the states and coalitions with states around New York, and also national programs that include Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We're a small nonprofit. We're only about 42 uh, members of the staff, but we are uh, multidisciplinary and we are basically multicultural and most of us are bilingual. Uh, we uh, provide services and programs um, both in English and Spanish when it's required. Um, the Latino Commission on AIDS was led by Denis de Leon, a uh, human rights lawyer and AIDS activist, until the day that he passed basically in 2009. And since then, our president, uh, current president, Guillermo Chacon, um, and he has a, a bigger focus on coalition building with different organizations and community mobilization and presence in media. The mission of um, our organization is to um, work to improve and expand access to healthcare. Um, as I mentioned, addressing viral hepatitis, HIV and AIDS, sexual transmitting infection, and creating community mobilization to address health disparities. We do this um, through our five core services. Uh, we have many programs, but we are like uh, organized in, in core services. The first one is health education and awareness, like the program that I present today later, uh, where we provide um, information to the community. We um, provide it with tools that they can use, and we create awareness around um, health disparities and problems that affect the Latino community. Uh, we have prevention and access to care, which is a more direct um, contact with clients. Uh, we provide them with HIV testing, uh, counseling. Um, we link them to care if it's needed, and we have patient navigation programs. We also have uh, programs that deliver um, support um, and uh, information directly in groups in our offices. We have a capacity building assistance program, which is one of the biggest part of the, of the commission. They provide, as the name is, a capacity building to different organizations around the country. Um, since this, since last year, uh, it is um, circumscribed only to the south of the country because uh, the epidemic is um, affecting the south uh, mostly. We have a health policy and community action program um, that, um, together with different organizations, create um, a, a advocacy part of the commission, and we do advocacy directly in Albany and also in Washington. And uh, recently we have um, held a summit uh, with different leaders of Latino organizations um, that have produced a document that we will be using to um, advocate for health policy at every level, either local, uh, regional, and national. 
And uh, we also come with a research department that uh, studies the behavioral health of the Hispanic community. Okay, so now I would like, in the next two slides, I would like to present, uh, to talk about very briefly uh, the summary of how the HIV epidemic happened in the state and, and how, where, where are we now. As we all know, uh, the epidemic started in 1981 with uh, the first patients in both California and New York. Um, at that point, nobody knew what it was. Uh, it took a few years to find out uh, what virus was causing it. It was in 1984. So we finally uh, find out which virus was it. And in 1985, we were able to put it a name in HIV and, and, and the disease was called AIDS. Um, it was in, in 1986 that we were able to have uh, the first lab test in, in ELISA to be able to diagnose um, uh, people carrying the virus. Uh, and the following year in 87, uh, CDC approved the first medication that was uh, used, ACT or cyclobutin. But um, it wasn't until later that we were able to um, have any impact on the curve of this epidemic. Uh, the first years, uh, we all know that it was very dramatic and the numbers of deaths and diagnosis were increasing dramatically until the beginning of the 90s. It was in 1996 when uh, with the uh, um, production of new medication, uh, at that point protein inhibitors and that we could definitely have an impact finally on this um, epidemic and the numbers of diagnosis and deaths were coming down. Since then, um, the curve was flattened, uh, but still we're having a problem with HIV. It's, it's going down very slowly. You know? and we, um, there's new, tech, new, new measures, that, a new laws, a new everything that we're using to um, try to um, make this epidemic even uh, lower. In 2006, new laws were introduced um, that um, made HIV testing a part of the routine test. And still, you know, in all the countries, different laws prevent us to um, doing this without consent of the patient. But we are working towards uh, changes in the law that is gonna be um, implemented through the years. In 2012, uh, the FDA approved um, PrEP, which is a medication, a pill that we take every day uh, if you are HIV negative to prevent getting infected with HIV. Also, uh, as PrEP is still there, and in 2016 and 17, this new concept about you equals you was um, made uh, available, um, which means undetectable equals untransmittable. It's a very important um, fact based on science that people living with HIV uh, and whose viral loads are undetectable, meaning less than 200 copies per milliliter, and our own treatment uh, cannot pass transmit the HIV virus to other person through sex. No? So this is um, a very important finding because uh, through the years, people living with HIV have been living with this stigma um, that they were carriers of this virus. But now, knowing that being on treatment and with viral suppression, um, the virus will not be transmitted even if you are having sex without condom through sex. So based on all these uh, findings and, and new uh, knowledge that we have, um, now we can talk about ending the epidemic. The first state to talk about the, uh, the ending epidemic was New York, New York State, when 2015 produced a blueprint of um, NAIDS um, with um, directions on what to do and how to do to end this epidemic by the year 2020, this year. We will not yet these numbers until all the information is collected. So probably next year or in, in, in 2022, we will know if we reach those goals. Uh, but also last year, at the beginning of 2019, the federal government also promulgated, pro produced um, a plan to end the epidemic uh, by the year 2030. Um, there are plans to end the epidemic, not only in the States and, and New York, is many states, different states have their own plans but also in the world, uh, United Nations had a plan um, to end AIDS by the year 2020, which is called 1999. So um, in the following slides, we're gonna talk about how the HIV epidemic um, is affecting Latinos in the USA. Um, because for what I just presented, we might think uh, since the numbers are going down, um, it should be for everybody the same. So I'm gonna show you what's happening with Latinos. Uh, by the year 2017, almost 10,000 Latinos were newly diagnosed with HIV in the States. And this is like approximately 27 Latinos per day every year being diagnosed with HIV. And this is a big number that needs to go down. 
We also know that one in six Latinos that are living with HIV and unaware of it, they, they, unaware that they have it, they don't know they have it. So this is something um, important to know because we need to continue promoting HIV testing uh, um, because um, this is beneficial for, for both reasons. One, for the person that is living with HIV, I don't know it because once it's diagnosed, can be linked to treatment and, and have a better uh, life um, outcome, uh, uh, health, a better health. And also for the community, because people living with HIV without being diagnosed are those the ones that are being um, transmitting the, the, the infection to other people. So in order for us to be able to control the epidemic, we need to find these people that are living with HIV not knowing it. Also, we know that most Latinos in the country, um, more than half, 53%, have never been tested uh, for HIV in their lifetime. And, and we know also know that CDC uh, recommends that everybody between the ages of 13 and 65 should be tested at least once in their lifetime uh, for HIV. Uh, so we need, still need to promote testing in our community. There's many reasons why people don't want to be tested uh, that we're going to talk about later. But um, yeah, so now um, people, uh, immigrants, Latinos don't go searching for access to care or HIV tests for fear of being deported, for being, of being caught, um, among other reasons. Uh, so uh, all these conditions that uh, in 2017, uh, we know that Latinos uh, represent only 18% of the population in the United States, but they accounted for uh, almost 26% of all the new HIV diagnoses and almost 22% of all new AIDS diagnoses. This is also important because Latinos, when they go to be tested for HIV, they go at a late stage. Um, Latinos don't, don't go to test routinely, don't go to test to see if, if, if something happens. They wait until they are sick or they started feeling sick. At a point uh, when they are diagnosed, probably they are already diagnosed not only with HIV, but with AIDS or third state HIV infection. And this also affects the outcome. It's very important for, um, for us in England to communicate to our community they need to be tested and the earlier the better and, and frequent is also um, and frequency is also important the, the, that number that i just presented was in 2017 so i wanted to, you to see 2018 to see how things changed just in one year um, the number in general the total number of new infections has dropped it was 38,000 and change and this year um, the following year was less than 38,000. but the number of hispanics or latinos infected um, was in 10,000 the previous year, and now it's over 10,000, and the percentage is 27%. So we can see that even though the numbers in general are dropping, um, our numbers in Latinos are going up. Um, we also can notice here that uh, Afro-Americans and Black people um, are affected more than us Latinos. Uh, it has been for a long time, uh, but even in them, even though they are still more, more affected than us, the, the curve is going down different to us that is going up. Uh, data collected by the CDC from the years 2008 to 2016 showed that the total, in the total population, the number of uh, new HIV diagnoses dropped 18% in that period of the time. Even in Latinos in general, dropped 4%. But if we focus on a subgroup, a subpopulation within Latinos, which is Hispanic Latino men who have sex with men, MSM, the number, the number increased 17%. So this, this data is important for us to know what group, what group in the population we have to focus our efforts to um, uh, increase uh, information about testing and prevention and also treatment. Um, this is just to reinforce the idea and, and we also see that accumulated cases of HIV and AIDS by race and ethnicity. Again, the, the, big, uh, the bigger group affected is Afro-Americans, um, African-Americans with um, a big, big, big number of cases in total. Uh, almost a half a million. And we know that it's um, an estimated number of people living with HIV in the States is a million to 200,000. But the number here represents people have been diagnosed and tested. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's 50% uh, people living with HIV who don't know it. Um, but the rate, if we see the rate, um, uh, we can compare that uh, the rates between uh, ethnicities. Um, Afro-Americans and Latinos are high, a, rate, a very high rate compared to whites, which means we are more, um, we had our chance to get infected is higher than whites. 
if this continues like this, nothing changes. Um, we're going, we can say that one in five Latino MSM men who have sex with men uh, are going to be diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. Same as one in every 48 cis Latino men and one in every 227 cis Latino women. Transgender, trans Latinas is a different thing. Uh, for a long time, um, the, the um, CDC and the Department of Health were not collecting information on the trans communities. Uh, it wasn't until recently that they started collecting and now we can estimate that about one in four Latinas trans women are living with HIV. This is a very high number, it's 25%. Um, we know uh, that uh, trans women of color, black and Latinas, uh, are uh, very much in, in risk to getting infected with HIV. Uh, the following slides is to show you a little bit about the distribution or where these people are living. Uh, so uh, among the Latino community. Um, so we, we can see here the new diagnosis of HIV among Latinos are very common in the South of this country and also in the West. And the people, and if we see the, the other line where people living with HIV, the higher number is in Northeast in New York and, and areas adjacent to us. Like, um, uh, it doesn't mean that um, we're living, uh, the, the people is moving or something. It's just like the new cases are higher in the South and in the West. Uh, and this graphic, uh, also from uh, information from CDC produced by HDU, shows that in 2016, 75% of all new Latinos that were diagnosed with HIV were li uh, living in the South and in the West. If we want to know um, what the highest numbers are of HIV in what states in the United, in the United States these people is located, um, is California, New York, Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico, which are the states basically that have more um, Latino population. And in this graphic, uh, we reinforce the idea and we can see that almost 70% of the new cases of uh, HIV among Latinos are located in these four states and in Puerto Rico. One thing that is very important also to know is um, that uh, more than half of Latinos diagnosed with HIV were um, born outside the United States. This doesn't mean that they brought the infection with them. This means that they were infected here and they were infected here because there is a lot of um, lack of access to healthcare, to testing, to information for the new immigrants. No? There's a lot of, of, of um, barriers for them, um, medical insurance, um, linguistic problems. So um, immigrants who just arrived to the country because of all the problems that they face, they're also a higher risk for getting infected with HIV. I mentioned PrEP as a pill that people can take uh, daily to prevent uh, HIV. And I also mentioned that the communities that are more at risk are uh, African-Americans and Latinos. Nevertheless, the people who um, take advantage or use PrEP more is the white community. So there is a need here for us to uh, continue promoting the use of PrEP in the communities that the mo most need it, African-Americans and Latinos. So after all these um, numbers and, and graphics, we can say that HIV among Latinos is a health disparity. Why is a health disparity? Why is causing this? It's not that we are born with genetically predisposition to get infected with HIV. It's, it's um, factors, uh, social factors um, that are already present in our society that are, um, make that we, that our community are more, um, a risk of getting infected and a risk of the infection progresses. There's a, by part of the um, authorities, the Department of Health, there is a lack of knowledge about the healthcare challenges faced by Hispanic Latinos. Um, it needs to be um, um, addressed, it needs to be studied, it needs to be investigated. What challenges are the ones that Latinos and Hispanic uh, face? And maybe we can do some change those things by advocacy. Uh, there is a lack of understanding about diversity within the Hispanic community, uh, not just uh, uh, between born and foreign born. Um, uh, we come from different countries, we come from different cultures, we, come from, we, we eat different and we sometimes speak a little bit different. So when we create programs, um, 
that are directed to the Latino community, they had to be, uh, um, they, they had to try to use a language that can be understood by every Latino, uh, because we know that uh, people in Argentina, in Mexico, and Puerto Rico, we speak different. Um, so we don't want to use language that is just particularly for one country. We need to use a, a, a flat Spanish that can be understood for everybody. And, and, and we have to be careful also when we produce um, messages um, in Spanish that do it in Spanish and not just translating from English to Spanish because in translation sometimes we, we uh, lose information. And there is a limited linguistic and culturally competent services. We know that it's discrimination and racism. We know that it's homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia. Now these days with all these um, new laws that the government has implemented, there's a lot of fear uh, to be deported. And that's the reason why many Latinos do not seek for um, care, do not seek for um, um, preventive measures. Or they do not know where to go. Uh, there is also a lack of Hispanic healthcare workforce and service providers, um, for example, in California, the Hispanic community represents almost a third of the population, but only 5% of the workforce uh, in healthcare is, uh, is Latino. And um, it's important for us Latinos sometimes we get to go to a doctor and we want to be able to talk in our language to our doctor or, or feel this connection because we belong to the same uh, community. Uh, it can, cannot happen with such big difference of, um, when there's not, we need to promote that the young Latinos go to school and, and, and get a profession in the healthcare is going to be, uh, this is going to improve the Latino health in general. There's a lot of challenge faced by new immigrants, as I just mentioned. And um, we also need to um, be included in the research uh, in health studies. Um, right now, for example, COVID-19 is affecting also Latinos and African-Americans more than anybody else. So when they are planning the, the studies for the vaccine, Latinos and African Americans need to be included. Uh, so these, uh, the results can be applied to our community. Uh, in the same way, like in every uh, health study, they need to include um, a diver diversity group of um, pop people. And there is also challenges proper of aging and elderly Hispanics that live with HIV and chronic morbidities. But uh, aside from these mentions, these, these things that I just mentioned, um, and these all belong to social determinants of health. But social determinants of health also um, include uh, levels of poverty, where we live, where we work, how much money we, we, we get, if we have insurance or we are not, or we do not have insurance. These things are gonna determine how easy it is for us to get uh, to a clinic, to a hospital, to a doctor, to get tested. You know, if we are going to need to take three buses and, and a train to get to a clinic, we are not gonna do it. If we don't have internet, then we cannot get telehealth. And, and these type of services are, are um, established by society, the structure, structure society already. And we know um, how this has been working for the years in the United States and how several communities are um, um, uh, set in places uh, with a lack of services that they need to uh, survive. So, Despite the significant progress in the fight that has been done uh, against HIV, uh, with all these improvements in, in life, with these medications and, and prevention techniques, the incidence of HIV and new diagnoses are increasing among Latinos, driven primarily by infections and diagnosis in MSM, people, men who have sex with men, and in Latino youth. So we can say that there is an invisible HIV crisis, invisible because we don't notice unless we really pay attention, in Latino communities, and this deserves an increased national attention. Uh, we need to focus on these differences and, and, and find out what to do. So uh, at least uh, our numbers continue to going down like they were at one point and like everybody else. And, um, and there is a great need to address the problems or difficulties caused by social determinants of health, um, not just for Latinos, but also for every minority that lives in this country. Um, so now I want to talk about what the Latino Commission and, and, and AIDS uh, do about responding to this uh, epidemic among Latinos. I mentioned Latino Commission and AIDS uh, works uh, locally, regionally, and nationally with partners. We, mean we don't work alone. We work together with our uh, partners, different organizations that include Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Uh, some of the programs that we have, uh, I also mentioned a little bit about this. 
um, is Oasis LGBTQ Wellness Center, which is located on 29th Street and 7th Avenue. It's a wellness center where um, LGBTQ, Latino LGBTQ um, people can go there and receive services, uh, get tested for HIV, get tested for hepatitis, counseling, um, be referred to services, medical services they need. Uh, also, um, they can um, just be there, chill, hang out, and feel comfortable with their own um, um, gender expression uh, without being uh, um, ostracized or criticized or um, repelled or anything like that. We are open uh, for all uh, Latino LGBTQ for them to come and just stay with us as a the one. We we'll also have a Latino religious leadership program. Um, this program is a link between the commission and uh, as the na name mentioned, uh, leaders of religion, religious organizations in New York City. We find uh, that the need to, to educate uh, the religious leadership in New York City is big because Latinos, as we know, we are very religious in general. We come from very Catholic uh, countries and we come with this um, taboo uh, to talk about sex and, and, and because religion and, and HIV, I didn't go well. So we are trying to um, educate um, and through these um, religious leaders get to the community that sometimes they want to talk about these things. So if they come from the religious leaders, if you feel for them perhaps to talk about how to prevent HIV and, and what to do if I, if I want to get tested or if I am infected. Latinos in the South is a branch of Latino Commission on AIDS located in North Carolina. And from there, we have influence to seven states in the South through coalitions that we have built uh, through the years with uh, different organizations. Um, also creating awareness and providing services to the Latino community in those uh, states and um, um, providing capacity building. Um, our main capacity building assistance program is called Hands United, funded by CDC and um, is um, providing uh, capacity building to organizations in the South. Uh, from Florida to uh, Delaware and until Texas, I think. Um, the National Hispanic Latinx Health Leadership Summit. Uh, this is something um, almost brand new. Uh, we met for the first time in March in Washington, D.C. Uh, with different uh, Latino leaders from different organizations to create, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a document um, addressing the needs, uh, the health needs of the Latino community that we are gonna to use to advocate for um, laws that are going to uh, improve the health of the Latinos. And this is gonna be used, this can be used um, at the, every level, like every organization that was there, if they want to use it to advocate for the health of their community, they can take this document and, and to their mayor or to the governor, or we can take it to the senators and, and present it to um, the candidates now that are possibly to be president of this country. And uh, National Latino AIDS Awareness Day, which is the thing that I'm gonna talk next. Um, these are the, the logos, okay. So National Latino Latinx AIDS Awareness Day, which is observed today, observed the thing, is the Commission Signature Awareness Initiative. We have a few more uh, and had for hepatitis and we have the zero campaigns, which is zero homophobia and zero transphobia uh, that we also are promoting. But this one is to do attention to the critical role that HIV testing and prevention education plays to stop the spread of HIV and AIDS among Latino communities. You know, annually, every October 15, um, the Commission mobilizes community organizations in more than 50 states, uh, 25 states. Um, uh, last year, we had uh, 24 states. So the previous year, we had 27 states. Um, it's just depending on where the, the organizations that are participating are located. Um, but it's definitely across the country and they host prevention um, events, HIV prevention, education and testing initiatives. Um, we have this year less than last year, probably because of the COVID-19 um, epidemic that is affecting the way that we are interacting and the way that we are organizing events. Uh, but we, we have been able to have a, one event this year in Hawaii, for example. Um, NLAT uh, was uh, developed by the Latino Commission AIDS in the year 2003. It means uh, this year, this campaign is the campaign number 18. No, um, these national campaigns are implemented um, and they're organized at the 
macro level, like we, the Commission, and a few other organizations in the Hispanic Federation. Um, we create a campaign every year uh, with a different theme, with a different um, poster. Um, we organize um, donation of HIV test, uh, testing kits, and we coordinate um, a web page and social media. But it depends. Um, it, the, the campaign has to be implemented locally. Every organization that participates in the end of the campaign organize their own event um, appropriate to the community, to what they think their needs are. Um, it can be any type of event. Um, it's a collective movement because we cannot do it alone. Uh, we need the help, the support, and the collaboration of different organizations and different places in the country uh, to educate and mobilize the communities, the Latino communities, to increase the knowledge about the dangers of HIV and its prevalence in Hispanic communities. There is still a lot of misinformation, uh, myths that need to be um, changed. And this is our mission. We need to bring the real information, facts, and, and new information about HIV and try to educate our community so they learn how to prevent, how to treat, and what to do if they are uh, at risk of infection. The objection, uh, the, the, object, the objective of the campaign is, as I mentioned, to draw a campaign uh, to the important role that HIV diagnosis detects, preventing education, PrEP and PEP, care and treatment, and you, because you play in the fight in this epidemic. I mentioned we have 18 campaigns uh, as of today, and these are some of the posters through the years. Um, and we can see the evolution of the campaign and, and the message was changing. Um, and in the first one, uh, we have the message was Abre los ojos, which is open the eyes. It's like telling the community to, uh, to realize that this is happening, that this exists, and do not uh, be blind towards the reality. And, and after that, um, we wanted to uh, provide the information that Everybody is at risk, not just people that is considered um, gay or bisexual or who's using drugs. I mean, everybody who is having sex is at risk of getting, getting infected with HIV. And therefore, everybody needs to know about this, um, what to do, what to go tested, what treatment exists, and, and, and how ways, new ways to prevent it. Um, we continued. Uh, these are the four last posters before the one this year. Um, I was part of the three last ones. And we wanted to be more inclusive and diverse as our community is. But we also wanted to focus a little bit more on the pillars that we have now to end the epidemic. And the, the one of uh, the superheroes was a very um, successful campaign and where we um, used uh, the tools that we have to end this epidemic as superpowers. So everybody can be a superhero. I'm a superhero, I take PrEP. I'm a superhero, I use condoms. So I take my medication, why I get tested. The following year we use um, um, the poster that was also very well received by the community where we represent um, the tools again. And last year, we wanted to be a, a little bit different and wanted to fight stigma um, because we also say people that are HIV positive or HIV negative. We want to be like, we are, all, we are you know, all of us positive and negative together in, in this fight uh, because without the help of everybody, and depends on, independently of, of the HIV status, we cannot do this. So through the years, since 2003, we have been able to test more than 80,000 Latinos through the NLAT events that we have um, organized. And we have mobilized approximately 500 different organizations, health departments, in more than 250 cities in the country and 40 states and territories. This is in total since 2003. Uh, we have been able to build and maintain a national network with different CBOs, health departments, uh, federal agencies like um, HERSA, CDC, HHS, uh, organizations like HPU and HIV.gov, and other partners like uh, pharmaceutical companies and laboratories that produce HIV test kits that are the ones who donate the test kits for the events, like Rashur, Abbott, and Biolitica. We continue to promote HIV testing, PrEP, Quantum use, HIV treatment, and recently we added our concept of U equals U. This year, early 2020, uh, we launched a campaign um, in sept early September, and we asked people to help disseminate the information, uh, posting on the social media to use the hashtags NLAT2020, HIV fingertips, and NLAT. Different to previous years, um, we decided not to have just one poster. Uh, we have a series of posters, uh, six posters these years, and uh, the theme was at your fingertips. It was a, a creative um, moment of all of us uh, brainstorming and about 
what campaign are we de developing this year? Uh, we were in the middle of the COVID-19 campaign uh, uh, epidemic, and we were in the middle of uh, social unrest and problems with Black Lives Matter and, and, and um, racial injustice and inequity. So we wanted to be able to include all these things because these are the things that are happening this year. Um, it was a little difficult to include uh, the inequities and the injustice in the posters and the theme, but we included in the webinars. But uh, when we decided to include the COVID-19 and, and how this was impacting our lives and how we are uh, adjusting to the changes that this new epidemic are imposing into our lives, we wanted to uh, mention that um, different to other viruses without mentioning COVID-19, right? Um, the things that we already have for HIV are our fingertips are at the reach of our hands. We can easily get tested, we can easily prevent it, we can easily get treated, we can easily not transmit it. So we already have all the tools at, at, at our fingertips. So we created a one poster for each one of the tools that we have, and we um, delivered this message through our campaign this year. We also updated our webpage in LADA.org, uh, in which people can go and browse it, um, find information, about uh, not only the campaign, but also about HIV and what to get tested, the importance of getting tested, the importance of um, um, knowing, uh, if, if empowering to know uh, if you are positive or negative, um, because if not, you are living um, blind to the reality. Once you know, you know what to do. Once you know, you can choose the right option to do. Um, you can talk to your doctor, uh, and, and receive counseling in what preventive measures you can use, or if you are positive immediately, you can start treatment and have a better outcome in your life. Um, information about prevention techniques, information about PrEP, PEP, and, and, and condoms, information about treatment and what to get treated and how to get linked um, to medical care. But also uh, we pro um, produce um, resources like um, infographics, that you saw at the beginning of the, of the presentation and posters of the campaign that can be downloaded um, from our webpage by different organizations that would need that to uh, their own events. We also post the webinars that we produce every year in our website. But also we have a, um, a, a this here registration link for the people that are organizations that are creating um, their own events. We would like them always to register their event with us so we know we have an idea of how many events are happening every year in the country and how many uh, events that are testing people are going on in our country. So once they click this, they are taken to this page, which is a remote page, where they have to fill the information of the event. And, and they can also request on this form uh, a donation of HIV test, uh, a kit of 25 tests that they can use for their own event. Once we receive the information of the, of the events, uh, we post them in our website uh, in pages like this. When we go to events here, we can uh, go to uh, a list of every event that is happening in the country uh, uh, around England. And they happen in different days. They do not happen all on October 15. They start happening before and some of them go until November. So uh, a person that goes to our website uh, can go to the events link and see where in the country or close to the person where they are living, um, where they are living uh, can, can find an event and they can go and attend the event. This year, as I mentioned, um, the events are smaller than the previous years because of COVID-19 restrictions and many have gone virtual. This year to see um, last year posters. Every event is independent. Every event can use our poster or they can create their own poster. So depending on, on, on the event, um, it, they can be very uh, elaborated and very fancy and very big. Like um, the one that the Department of Health in New York City did last year was called To Skin Say, it was a dance uh, called La Quinceañera. But there are also different um, um, types of events. I mean, depending on the community and how the organization wants to get the attention and how they can get more people coming to the event. They know they're going to be uh, receiving information about HIV, but they're also going to have fun and, or, or, or eat a, a food, like a food bazaar in Chicago last year, or they can go to a, an educational training or they can go to um, a, a cultural festival, uh, like the one um, that this organization did last year it was a dine, dinner, a culinary dropout. There's many ways and, and, and every organization um, is free to elaborate, to create their event 
um, doing what they think is going to get more attention from the community. We also have um, social networks. Social media is a very important part of our campaign because this is the way that we deliver a lot of information. We tweet um, um, every day, it's a lot of work, but we, um, we have um, a lot of followers and they receive information about the things that we're doing about the campaign. And not only that, but information about HIV um, in general. Uh, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, uh, page uh, a Twitter account, and a YouTube channel where we post videos that we produce, um, um, not only webinars, but also um, public service announcements and um, press conferences. Part of the campaign every year are webinars. We produce webinars uh, that are delivered to um, mostly the people who attend our webinars are um, uh, people that are already working in the field in different organizations. We have a, a network of over 6,000 uh, contacts uh, that receive information um, when we do this uh, campaign. So this year we had four um, webinars. And as you can see already, there is a lot of COVID-19 in this. Um, we, we noticed uh, that once the COVID-19 epidemic started um, and clinics and hospitals and organizations has to close down, and we have to maintain our social distancing. Uh, and the number of HIV tests drop dramatically. So we needed to um, do something uh, about it. I mean, numbers are going up again because different places are opening up, but um, we wanted to promote self-testing, HIV self-testing. So we contacted um, people that knows about this and, and provide information to um, over almost 500 attendees about how to do self-testing and where to go and how this works. So then we have a second webinar already. Uh, and this is where we included what we wanted to do at the beginning. It's like we need to talk about the social and racial injustice and how we can change this. So we have a webinar about social determinants of health and HIV in Latin and communities of colors. And a lot of information was presented and it was very well attended. And, and we talk about um, HIV, but we also talk about a lot about COVID-19. And COVID-19 has um, uh, just, make more um, make us more aware of these limitations that we communities of color have to access healthcare and why we are more impacted by epidemics like HIV and COVID-19. The reason why we Latinos and African Americans are more impacted by this uh, uh, and not only those two but many other health um, conditions. Um, we also had um, uh, recently yesterday um, our third webinar about advancing the end of the HIV epidemic initiative uh, where health lead from the Department of Health and Human Services um, came and shared uh, about this plan that was released last year to end the epidemic in the country and what's going on with it and the advances that it has done and how COVID-19 is affecting the development of this plan. And we have one more webinar next week about undetectable equals untransmittable, what I mentioned at the beginning, and the message and the movement of it. Also, every year we have an NLA press conference. Um, um, we get together with different organizations, partners, um, different communities that come and support us um, to deliver the information why it, it feel important that we continue having uh, these campaigns every year. Um, we have people coming from the Department of Health, the New York State or New York City, um, different organizations uh, from different counties, uh, Queens, Brooklyn, um, Manhattan, Bronx, come and, and, and share um, why their community still needs to get informed, be informed, to get information actual and factual, um, and need to be educated about the risk of HIV in the community and, and what they can do about this. It is empowering that the community learn um, what their needs are and what they have available that they can use. Uh, this year, unfortunately, we are not going to be able to have the same press conference that we have every year at the city, city hall steps um, because of COVID-19 restrictions. But tomorrow, we are releasing our virtual press conference, uh, the one that we just uh, created last week. Uh, we needed, uh, we wanted to continue doing this, um, and we are adapting to the new reality. We work virtual every day, so we are doing a virtual press conference as well. This, I can, let me see if it works. Um, mm -mm, I don't think I can make it work. This, um, oh, it is. 
the press conference from last year. Uh, Uh, as you can see, also elected officials join us every year uh, in our press conference um, to deliver the message to the press and to the people who attend it. So um, it makes uh, a little bit more um, accessible for the media when we have elected officials talking. And finally, um, every year we, we have to show some results um, of what we have done with, through NLAD and through the NLAD events in the country. Uh, so this is what, what happened last year, 2019. We, we were able to reach up to 40,000 people through the different events, 106 events in 40 different states uh, in the country. Um, the type of event are different. Um, we have 51 in which they were only giving information, dissemination, um, probably HIV tests. Uh, but we have also cultural events, health first, and uh, forums where people go and be educated about HIV. We delivered five webinars last year, no? um, um, with a total of 825 participants, um, an increase of 60% compared to 2018. And I have to say that this year, 2020, we are very happy that our numbers have gone higher, much higher, and we have almost 500 participants in every webinar. Um, this is very good. Um, and also the important part of this campaign is the number of HIV tests that we can uh, done, we can do, uh, last year, we were able to have um, over 2,000 HIV tests done through uh, um, NLAT campaigns. Um, and, and we also connect people to PrEP and we deliver, distribute um, uh, condoms to this uh, NLAT event. Not only condoms, but also flyers and pamphlets and information about HIV, risk, uh, where to get tested, uh, what they can do to prevent, and if you are positive, what you can do to get a better outcome in your health, get treated immediately. So to end this, um, we Latinos are the, now uh, the biggest minority group, minority in this country, and we are growing uh, very fast. So if we don't address the health disparities that are affecting us right now, uh, they are gonna grow with us. So they are gonna become a bigger problem for the country. And just to mention some things, for example, Latinos represent only 13% of web users, and we know that one in four Latinas, trans Latinas, are living with HIV. Uh, these challenges are very worrisome and we have to react to them and we have to do something about these big innovative programs, uh, partnership coalitions and moving our workforce where the epidemic is growing, which is the South. And that's how we, we are doing this commission. So we're trying to make uh, uh, an impact in the Latino health. And with this, we're trying to make an impact in, that, in the health of all Americans. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Louis. Um, good evening, everyone. This is Richard, Senator Carmi's office. Uh, uh, Mr. Louis uh, Mares, you know, I think that was a, a very important uh, uh, presentation that you made. And uh, there are two things in particular that I found to be interesting. Uh, so far on Facebook, I don't see any questions. So if I may, um, you know, you did make an important part point about, uh, you know, when, when we're communicating access to certain services, available programs, it's important not to think of just translating into Spanish from English, right? Um, um, people in the Latin American community uh, come from diverse cultures within the Latin American 
community in different parts of South America, of Central America, et cetera. And so when we're translating, we have to make sure that we're speak the, the Spanish that is used is, is still culturally appropriate and accessible to um, 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 those members of the uh, Latin, um, Latin American population um, who are struggling to access services once they do arrive. Um, and you also mentioned about, you know, with the political climate, a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, struggling working class um, members of the Latin American community afraid to access services because of um, any repercussions to their immigration status being deported, at, um, et cetera. Perhaps what advice would you give um, members of the community who engage with um, um, these pop, um, these individuals um, to effectively communicate with them and encourage them to access HIV AIDS programs and services. What, what can we do to, to effectively engage? With? Well, we, we, yes, we, we working on that. We, we work together with, um, for example, the Immigration Coalition in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and we not only work uh, at the level of advocacy and trying to abolish all these laws. In New York City or New York State, it's easier than other parts of the country um, for people living um, in, in, in a documented state. We, we have more access and, and, and ways to provide them with uh, services, but in other, other parts of the country, it's, it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, what I would recommend these uh, individuals is like um, to try to find out organizations where they can go. There are many organizations in the country um, that work uh, with these communities and then can provide them with services and uh, not necessarily affecting um, their status or, I mean, uh, in general, hospitals are not places where they are going to um, uh, take them to ICE or take them to, uh, the hospitals are very safe. Um, they are working with the patient as a patient as anybody else and they, they still need to go get, um, get tested and get treated if they need it. And also, um, uh, there is a fear now uh, with this um, rule of charge, I think it's called, where people that are in the process of getting their, their residency or their citizenship do not want to have um, um, records of receiving um, Medicaid or this type of thing that might affect their uh, status. So it's, we're working hard also trying with other intentions to change this. Um, it's, it's difficult, but um, we're working on that. Okay, thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Marius. Uh, I also see Senator Leroy Comrie um, is on. Senator, if perhaps you might want to uh, say a few words. 